if you believe in something, believe in it and believe in yourself and just do it. And when people say you can't do it, you you either think I can do it or really look at, is it worth doing? There's definitely a kind of shiny object syndrome where you think, where you go, oh, that's a really great idea. I'm going to do that. And it's not, it's a terrible idea for you right then. And even though you, but doing it, you learn a bit and you learn something from it. So yeah, negative Nancy's. Yeah, negative Nancy is not a great person. Hey gang, how you doing? Welcome in. Uh, hey everybody. Thank you. Welcome in everybody. So yeah, 15 years ago today, I started Data Transmission. For those that don't know, it's an online blog. and mag- I always think it's an online blog, a magazine, and the rest of it is everything else. And we have a radio station and we have three record labels. And we've done some new emotes in the chat for some 15s. I hope you like them. Um, thank you so much to everyone that sent me cake. You absolute Gs. Thank you so much. They're so tasty as well. Like, they look banging. They're so tasty. And even Laws, I don't have a sweet tooth secker. Enjoyed them. Uh, he got me a little card. He got me a card. Um, in a funny, actually, funny story. Something I, he arrived and I could hear a bottle clinking in the office. And I was like, oh, no, he's bought booze. I, don't, I, I really don't want to drink at the moment at all. And I was like, oh, no, he's bought booze. I really don't want to drink. People, Everyone bought me booze for Christmas as well. And Laws basically I bought no secos and no booze, but but alcohol-free booze. So bless him. I actually brought it here because it was, he actually knows what I like. It actually knows. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Laws. Thank you so much. Today, right, I've basically written a stream that's 15, basically 15 things that we've done over the 15 years of data transmission. It's going to be like, a, like I actually started writing this this morning and it took me, I was writing, I got up at half four like normal and started writing it out and started planning it out. And then I still not finished writing it. So I've had to go down to bullet points and just hope they jog my brain for the rest of this stream. I've picked some tracks to play in between when I have some tea. Because let's face it, it's going to be me talking for two hours otherwise. Uh, we can play some some other fun stuff. We can play some games. We'll just be stupid like we normally are. But I thought we'd just like, there's loads of learning points in this. I've learned fucking shitloads over 15 years of running a company uh, or trying to run a company. Right, so Data Transmission launched in 2008, February the 1st. And before it launched online, it was a print magazine at Turn Mills. And I actually used to have one of them. I might have a picture on my Instagram. I think I put a picture on Instagram today. It looked like this. You can see it? There we go. Oh, there you go. See, it's similar font. See, whoa, zoom in. Right, yeah. So it looked like that. And it was basically a magazine called Data Transmission. And because we wanted to kind of transmit a whole load of information about the parties we were putting on. Basically, Turn Mills, we were programming all the, most of the events for Turn Mills in-house. We used to have Thursdays, which was Get Loaded, which is basically like an indie night. And we had the Happy Mondays there and they would be DJing and like Bez was there and like Spiral Carpets and all that kind of crew, that kind of Manchester crew on a wet, on a Thursday night in Turn Mills, which is ridiculous because you come into work on a Friday and your desk was covered in all sorts of party funiculaire uh, and you'd have to wipe it off and then you could start work because our office was the kind of green room basically for the whole club. And then... On Fridays, we'd have the gallery, which is the gallery run for flipping donkeys. I think it stopped now, which is really sad because it was like the longest running club show. Trance on a Fridays, every Friday. And that run for like, I think 20, at least, at least, I remember going to the 20th birthday when it was a ministry because it moved to ministry. But I remember like my first one was the sixth or seventh birthday and it was Chiesto on a Friday at the seventh birthday. And that was ridiculous. And it was trance every Friday. And I saw some, we had some great people there. And I love trance so far, so that, those times. So, And then Saturdays were mix up. So we either had Kinky Malinky. We had a thing called Smarty Party, which was absolutely banged. If you don't, for those that didn't ever know it, there's a guy called Trace Harris. And his brother was the Milky Bar Kid. And the actual Milky Bar, the original Milky Bar Kid, for those that know what Milky Bar is. Um, he, he, and he'd always come into the office and he'd bring us loads of chocolate because his brother used to get loads of chocolate. And he used to think of a smarty party and it absolutely packed. And he'd never, he'd only book like one headliner and loads of like just resident up and coming DJs that were ticket sellers that would sell loads of tickets. Um, but it absolutely was packed always, every time. And then on the final Saturday of the month was was Together. And that was the thing we programmed in-house. We started it with Chemical Brothers way, way back on the, the 2000 party. And it evolved into something horrible when it left. But basically, we did program Together. And when that, we had some amazing people. Like we had Justice play their first ever UK gig. We had Eric Prid's first ever UK gig. We had to actually get him on a boat because he wouldn't fly then. 
Uh, and it took him ages to get over. Uh, and that was just after Call On Me came out and it was mental. Josh Wink was was one of the residents. Justin Robinson was a resident and he used to play every time in the last set. And that was always funny because we'd try and make him do poppers before his set just to make it even more messy. Like we had we had some we had Swedish House Mafia play that party and they we paid him 200 quid and they played in the room two and it was really before they even got big you know um, so that together party was mental and we always used to have fancy dress themes to that and we had like one where we would have in the th- fourth uh, third or fourth room we'd have like rappers in there and um, we had Lethal Bizzle in there and basically the theme was because the next day was Mother's Day and we were like basically like the theme was going to be dress as your mum and basically we all we arrived to go and meet Lethal Bizzle at the front door all dressed as our mums wigs and dresses and that obviously was just a head fuck for him and it was quite funny like, I don't imagine what he would have thought like rocking up and seeing us in our mums dressed up as our mums at the front of turn mills uh, also I meant be- that was the first time I met Beardy Man and I mean him are good friends now and um, he played in the back room and then he played at the Daily Transmission birthday uh, Christmas party one time as a surprise guest and then lately I'll be, I, last year I was helping him with social media we so that was yeah that was so that basically because we were programming all those events basically turn mills we had all these flyers and we were like we can eat and that was the way to pro, pro, post parties then it was either of those big street posters or it was like flyers and packs and every Friday we'd get boxes and boxes of packs and we'd have people out there handing out these putting out these flyer packs on, on the door on the doors handing out flyer packs um, and actually, one of the programmers for Avalon, in, in like he actually books all the events for Avalon, um, a guy called Nick Wilson, he was basically Blue Tack Nick, and he would go around sticking up all the posters and handing out the flyers, and then he became like the programmer for one of the biggest clubs in the LA. Mental. Um, and then, so then we had all these flyers, and basically, um, we instead of putting all the flyers up, we put uh, we made a book called Data Transmission and made the book on um, as an as as instead of having instead of having like all these flyers and we also put like little interviews in there and like we put like cut out ticket uh ticket uh free drinks tokens you had to cut it out and then you bring it in you'd have a free drink and so then that was called data transmission we had this magazine that's called data transmission and then i basically had the I, my job at terminals was all the online and we basically just had a front page that had the where you could get the magazines and look out for them but this logo is the original logo which we had which i had done and um, when we sort of basically when the club closed we were like oh as the club the club closed in march 2008 and in that kind of period once we knew the club was closing we knew the club was closing in maybe october november of 2007 and then basically it was like what am i going to do after and then we'd already been doing lock and load and we'd already been kind of doing southwest four and get loaded in the park and that was already happening and that's why kind of the club was closing because we we're kind of doing these big festivals at the end of august but through the summer the club was just getting hammered with not very many busy parties because we just didn't have time to promote them all and then basically the club was closing and i was doing all basically i was doing all the online all the e-flyers all the mail outs uh, and that was my job, basically. We took that into a separate company called Data Transmission, but also we did an online magazine. And it started with me, uh, Ben Gamori, who is now a DJ producer, and he was DJ and producing back then, and he'd do all the podcasts and stuff back then. And then uh, a guy called Mark Batchelor, and he was on sales, basically. We didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue how to run a company. and just kind of thrown at the deep end at maybe, how old was I then? 2008, I'd have been... And then back then, we so we took this thing online and we were like, right, we're going to create a website where it's just editorial and content. Because there was only, at the time, Resident Advisor, um, they'd maybe been about five years. Because I remember meeting those guys that came into, they came into Terminals to show us Resident Advisor when that launched. There was Fact, maybe, because I think they're a bit older. And there was a website called Don't Stay In, for those that remember Don't Stay In. It was like a, basically a social media for, for going out clubbing. And you'd upload photos and comment on each other's photos. And it was literally Facebook for clubbing. And it was really cool. But then when Facebook came, it just died. And they sold to Mixmag, but a year too late, probably, I think. Mixmag bought it and then, but it was a year too late. And then Mixmag and DJ Mag were about, obviously, they'd been about magazine for for long before that. But they, their online was just like the front cover of the magazine. And that was it. And they were just to go and buy the cover, buy the magazine. They hadn't gone digital with any of their content. That didn't happen until maybe three, four, five years into DT being about. Three, maybe three years, maybe about. So we, then we launched and there was like this mad space of just being able to write content about anything that wasn't what, what RA were doing. Because RA were kind of very in what the RA do, house and that kind of techno, and but in their own world of being really obscure and doing what they do really well. And we just wanted to be everything else. Really good house music, like big piano house and big drum and bass and all of the stuff that they basically wouldn't touch. We were in that space. And that was kind of where we were at the start. and. Then all the logo came about. Uh, and the, so if you don't know, this this part of the logo is literally a Gary. And you've got a little corner, a little, a little cheeky quarter chipped off to start you, to start you on your way. 
Uh, and there's like, little, this is all the dust from that from 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 the little cheeky quarter being chipped, and kind of. Um, so those that didn't know that, yeah, uh, the lick test, yeah. <laughs> Sick. Um, so that was that, and then that was basically then term was closed and DT. I was working full time on DT, and we were in the main same office with all the lock and load guys and all the Southwest Four guys. Um, and essentially that was the life. It was just like building mailers and writing content. And then basically at some point, uh, I think it was, we launched in February. I know me and I know Ben went to IMS in 2000, early 2000. I think it was 2009. Maybe we moved to a normal office and we moved to an office in Holloway road. Um, which is basically right by, it was right by where the Arsenal Stadium, uh, stadium is. So Arsenal Stadium, uh, for those that know that part of London, Arsenal Stadium was there, literally around the corner, it was our office. And it was uh, like, it was just this massive space, but our our office was, it cost me 250 quid a month to have this office, which is like ridiculous, so cheap. We had our office, which which at one point we had 19 people in that office and it was, we had such a big space for that 250. Like now you'd probably get like, less space in the shed and we're so, like it was such a big space we had this big office space we had a bit we had a kitchen a toilet the only problem was it was really dark it was there was only one tiny little window and it was about it was about this big like literally that big and and there was trees growing up part half of it so there was only a little bit of light came in so it was always really dark in there and it, people moaned about the darkness but i was i was actually happy because when we'd come out of turn mills we had literally no we had literally a a, this space which had no windows and sometimes we were we were it was snowing upstairs and basically we didn't even know that it started snowing and stopped snowing and, and the sun had come out and because we'd been in this downstairs office in this in, in the middle of in the depth of turn mills so we had this win- one window and it was amazing and we had a scare electrics in there and we were, we'd do car racing and when we moved in there there was literally nothing no nothing on the floor not even a carpet we had to buy a carpet we had to buy desks uh, like me and Mark, which he moved in there the first day, the first day we got the keys, we were like, we're going to work there. I don't care if we can't, we have to sit on the floor. We're going to work in this office because it's, because it's ours. And it was like that kind of buzz about it, you know? And um, I think we had one little purple stool and I think one of us sat on the purple stool and then we pulled in this couch from, which was in the hallway because of this massive long hallway. And we pulled that in and while one of us sat on the couch and one of us sat on the office uh, hey, Shell, how's he doing? Yeah, it was proper. It was like that. And then we bought a carpet, a purple carpet. I remember that. And then we we went and bought desks up the road and we tried to carry them down the street. It was ridiculous because it was so heavy and it was so far. And then we basically, uh, I was living in Milton Keynes still. I was cover- traveling in from Milton Keynes to London. It was costing me 650 quid a month to commute into London every day uh, for two of us to sit in an office, which is, which is, which is crazy. So yeah, we used to, uh, so yeah, when we started, we used to work in, well, when we started the terminals, we had office in terminals. We were, the terminals office was mentor. It was literally above the T, T2. That was when we were working at terminals. And when we were at terminals, we used to have like DJs come in, they'd stick their head around the door and then they'd go down into T2 and practice. And, um, and funny, like Nicole Muda, Nicole, Nicole Mudeba actually learned to DJ beneath us one year because she was a party promoter. And she used to do like the back room at, at gallery. And then basically she decided she wanted to be a DJ um and she basically came to and you literally would hear her every day down in t2 learning to dj um which was mental and now obviously she's massive and touring the world and a huge technoized um but yeah in holloway we had like so we had this it was good we had we had a good space we had a good we had there was me ben and mark and um uh and then we had the office downstairs but also upstairs there was this mad like this room that was literally the whole width of the whole building and it was a literally a party space and the the, the the at the front of the office, the front of the building, there was the t-shirt company, and they always used to have parties in there, which we should have definitely done. And we now looking back, we should have definitely been live streaming in there because it had great internet uh, for the time, and we could have we could have done live streams in there, which is utterly stupid. Like it was a mental space. And they were making t-shirts, and we should have got more out of the t-shirt company. We should have done more t-shirts and more more merch back then because we had quite a good community and quite a good a load of people that turn up to parties. And then. And that was life for a while. Like we stayed in Holloway Road, 2009, 2010, maybe even into 2011. And then Mark basically left. Ben left in 2010, two years he did. And then basically we got a new editor called Joe Gamp who really went down the kind of scuba route. And I really didn't like the music he was putting on the site. And we really just fell out all the time because he didn't, the music, our music I liked, the music he didn't like was definitely different. 
And I was like, I don't want this on the site. And back then, when Ben left, I should have taken over as editor and I should have been editor and then had a salesperson doing sales. But then, because but at that time, I was still doing all the web design and still doing loads of design stuff for lock and load. And all that all that would literally take me most of my time. Um, it, would, it paid well, but it wasn't doing anything for DT. Like, it was just all external client work and it wasn't doing anything to build DT. It wasn't focusing on building DT. Um, and if I'd have, when Ben left, if I'd have just been me and Mark, Mark doing sales and cut the cost to load and just been the two of us, we things would have gone a different way for sure. If I'd have had to, if we even been doing sales and I'd have been doing content, because then the con- the sales we were making were easily covering the con- the two of us, and I could have just dropped that work because that work I was doing then was literally would it wouldn't there would be no stop to it all year. You the whole if you went on holiday, I'd have to take a laptop and I'd be doing it on holiday. I'd get up and do it on holiday, and then they because the demands were so high. So that was yeah, that was a bit of a mistake. Um, and then we hired designers and developers. We had a developer that was building stuff for the, for the main site because we coded all the site. Like we didn't use WordPress. The first site we didn't cut. We just coded everything in .NET, and it was like a full on backend. And everything we wanted to do, we basically built ourselves and really developed. We actually developed some mad tools on that site. That thinking about it now, if we'd have stripped them out, they would have been great little tools that actually now will be are now companies. The amount of, the amount of development we did in that sound. And at the time, I was doing lots of design. And then we moved into Holloway Road, like I said. And that was crazy. We had a good space there. The space there was mental. Like, I can't actually believe we had that was 250 quid. And we didn't do more with it. I was at the time, because like, I was doing, I, like, I'd come from doing IT and design for DT. I was doing all this web design. And all the time, I was always was like, I didn't want to go back to that. And it was always, everything I was trying to do was always pushing DT forward. Because I didn't want to go back to doing that. Because I actually didn't like doing it. And every, all the way through the years, all the way up to like 26, 15, 2016, it was always like, I really don't want to go backwards. I really don't. If I have to go backwards, I will go backwards, but I don't want to go backwards. And even when I thought DT was going to close in the mid years and thought I, I'm going to have to go back to it every time, it was I don't want to. Instead of realizing what I had been learning and learning all these new skills around social and, and content and what I had been learning and network I've been making, which I probably would have got a different job if I had closed, but really like just always was like that negative in your brain of like you're gonna to have to go back at some point you're gonna to have to go back so yeah and then uh early to that no, me, it was august 2009 we did our first ever dt party and i thought now this would be a good place to do a little musical interlude thanks tom Veranlo. welcome in dudio and i thought that our first dt party was mental and it was such a good time and we booked an amazing artist called Totally Normal Extinct Dinosaur and he'd literally just popped and this I think was actually his first London gig and he played live and he had two live dan- dinosaur dancers also on that lineup was Mark Adams so if anyone knows who Mark Adams is he's now the vice president and head of innovation at Vice Media um, he was on the, <laughs> he DJ'd that guy's a G and if you sit if you ever Google him and he's go and listen to what he speaks about he advises companies and he's such a like head of industry now um, so the fact that he was on that lineup as well was is crazy. We had uh, we got war paint and in and and, and Indian feathers, which again that you wouldn't do that now. But we basically bought two hundred of them and basically put them on everybody and everyone on the dance floor would go ooh, and then we face painted everyone, which was crazy because we basically would have an air horn go off and then everyone would go ooh and then it would, the the vibe of the party was mental. So I thought we'd have a little musical interlude with a bit of teed. I couldn't find the track I really love, which is Stickly Dinosaurs. Stick, stickly, Stickly, Stickly something, or Stickly Dinosaur. But this is Teed, and it's called The Garden. And this is, we booked him, and it was, yeah, great pie. <laughs>
So yeah, that was uh, Teed, or something number 16th Dinosaur, and The Garden. The vocalist is actually Tim. He does all his vocals. So when you see him live, he has a he has a he has a he has a, vo- he has a microphone on stage with him. So yeah, we ba- with that party, we basically got in the Metro newspaper. For those in London, is a free paper. Oh, is it still in London? It's still happening. It's a free it's a free paper that goes out every day, day weekdays. And we basically got in there as the featured party of the week. And the space we were doing is this pub called the Silver Bullet in Finsbury Park, um, which was basically just opposite the tube. You come out the tube, and it was just there, the Finsbury Park. We it was like this little rave done rave, rave dungeon. Um, it looked like a pub, but it went right the way back and it had this really good space for dancing. And we did a few parties there. We did a Halloween party there with Drums of Death, which was really cool. Uh, we did our Christmas party there with Grum and Beardy Man. Like a, like he was, we couldn't announce him and basically did it for free. And he basically just come up and did his mic thing without all his pedals and stuff. Just did him on the, him on the mic, which was really cool. And then, but yeah, for the for the tea party, basically it's 250 capacity and we had 750 turn up because we got this mad shout out and Teed was just popping back then. Um, so it was a really good party. Yeah, really, really cool. So that was the first party. And then around the same time, DT was, we were doing lots of content. We really got into that interview space. Like we were doing call interviews. We interviewed Robert Hood in the back of a cab because we, we got a call. And so you can interview him when he arrives. He was coming to play at Fabric. If you jump in the back of the cab with him, you could interview him there. And we basically had the camera and basically asked him loads of questions in the back of the cab and recorded it all and then had to transcribe it. It was mad. It was, it was really fun. Made some really cool content. And because you're in London with that space and you, you like that was one of the reasons we stayed in London because we had access to so many artists. They're all coming to that space and much easier to get these interviews and you could go and meet them places and just jump on a tube instead of having to like, well, before before COVID or anything, it was, you'd have to go into London and spend a whole day in London making making content. And um, we could just drop, a, drop across town. So it was worth paying that rent and worth me traveling in every day because we could... We could build the brand there, you know. Um, and around that time, 2008, we launched YouTube, which is the, third, the fourth big thing we did. Uh, we launched on YouTube for the first time. We've launched on YouTube many times. Had many failures on YouTube. So many mistakes. It's been ridiculous. But we basically launched 2008 on YouTube and was probably one of the first people on, one of the first dance music brands on YouTube. And a camera, we were literally using like a little digital camera with a plug-in, a mic, plug-in mic, which is just like a wired mic, which plugged into the back of the camera. And that was it. And it had a little tripod and we just just hold it and then basically interview and then put the carrot, edit it and put the words on screen, the question on screen. Um, So basic, but so like now I'd be like, what a great start. What a brilliant start. It was terrible, but it was a start. Um, And Ben was doing loads of that. And then he left and basically I didn't carry on. I just, I don't know what I was doing. Fuck me. I just, I don't even know what I was doing back then. I think I had my head up my ass a lot of the time. And I just, it just lapsed for so long. Probably that was 2010, maybe when he left. It probably, I didn't probably do start doing YouTube until 2013, 2014 when I started. And there was all that. So I think at that time of when YouTube was growing, like that as a platform, YouTube was growing. And we was like on there with great content, great opportunities for content because there's, there wasn't as many brands. We had access to all the DJs. Like we went to, we went to the, what's that place in Cornwall with the, the domes? Uh, we went there with Chasing Status, one of the first ever Chasing Status gigs. And we went on tour basically to this to the um what's that place called? Eco, Eco something in Cornwall. Eden Project. There you go. We went to the Eden Project with, with Chase and Status. Ridiculous. Would you never get on? You'd never get on that now. There'd be about a hundred people trying to blag it on there. And you'd have to have a full camera. We went there with a little camera like that, basically, and recorded a video. We interviewed so many, many people. Like we, when we did a Ben did a thing where he went to um we did 24 hours on Eurostar, and he basically went to Eurostar and went to Concrete in Paris, blag tickets on Eurostar. Got on it on a Friday night, got to Paris, went to the club, then got back on the train and come home in the morning and made a piece of content using a, using a little camera. Ridiculous, but really great. So it was really good content. And then that just, when he left, I just don't know why I didn't carry on. Because I still had the camera as well, because we DT had bought it. I think it was just a lack of confidence behind the camera, not wanting to be on the camera, not not being, you know, not being wanting to be on that face and being that person in front of the camera. Because uh, it is scary as hell, and and today it's still scary as hell. Like even now, I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. camera, ooh, mic, ooh. why mic? Now I'm a bit more stupid with it. I'm older and I don't really care. And I do care innately, but you know I don't. I'm trying not. You suppress it a bit better, don't you? Or just be stupid with it, mic, like that, or like with these, like just to break the con. <laughs> I've lost my train of thought now. So, and also I had someone in my ear telling me I wasn't good enough. Like, this is my last my last point. I had someone telling me that, that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't, you, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be that person. You, you just look stupid. So I had that person around me that was just generally awful. General, general awful. Um, so I didn't carry on being YouTube. And I didn't do a podcast when, when I could have, should have done. 
And then we relaunched on YouTube for the second time. Probably I started doing the tracks thing. I saw, I think I saw UKF doing it and I was like, well, that's quite cool. I, they're doing it in drum and bass. I could do it in house music because we were getting loads of track. We were talking about loads of tracks and loads of music. I'll just start doing it. And we, only, we weren't doing premieres then. We was before that. And I was like, I'll just start uploading to YouTube. But we got a few takedowns and a few people got pissed off of it. And I think then I just stopped it. Again, I think someone in my office said, don't do that. It's it's not a good idea. That'll never take off. And I listened to them instead of just going with it and going, being the being the people that were house music and not believing in my own, believing in what I, what I thought was right. Listening to other people um, when I, and just being having the conviction of my own conviction, you know, confidence in my own convictions, you know. So then, and then I relaunched and re, I re-relaunched again a little bit later and we did live streaming. I've seen everyone else doing live streaming and I thought, well, that's a good idea. We'll do live streaming. And basically, because we didn't have an office then, I was, that was when I was basic communities in London and we were working in Milton Keynes. Instead of, instead of trying to do live streaming here and just make something here in Milton Keynes where we've got loads of space and just work it out here, we started to do it in London. What a crap idea that was. It cost 500, 600 quid a, YouTube, a stream because we were hiring a venue with very little return on it absolutely disgraceful business idea uh so that lasted a long time because obviously there's no there was no money in it and there was no there was no return on it we couldn't get couldn't didn't do enough uh didn't didn't have enough reach to get sponsors even though we tried and it just cost a fortune so that failed massively quickly we had some great streams though and we got some and they were on like on they were all on youtube until i had to take them all down because when I re and then because at the same time we were putting up starting to put tracks up because we'd started soundcloud and i was putting the same tracks on youtube and they were actually growing youtube was growing nicely then and we were getting a nice sprite. We had some great tracks. We had Mark Knight's Ubiza. We had a million streams on YouTube. And it was really starting to fly them. And I should have just carried on doing that with that channel. Yeah, you're all that person in your life. You just dis- and think the skill is being able to discard those people. Yeah, exactly. You've just got to, you've got to, if you believe in something, believe in it and believe in yourself and just do it. And when people say you can't do it, you, you either think I can do it or really look at, is it worth doing? There's definitely a kind of shiny object syndrome where you think, where you go, oh, that's a really great idea. I'm going to do that. And it's not, it's a terrible idea for you right then. And even though you, but doing it, you learn a bit and you learn something from it. So yeah, negative Nancy's. Yeah, negative Nancy is not a great person. And then we re, 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 re launched on YouTube in 2015 when I started putting my content up there. And then, and then so basically I started making all that content that's basically what is the DT channel, the, my channel now. Uh, Graham Farmer's channel, which I started putting all that content on there, but that was the same channel we were putting all the music on. And basically, the music YouTube was going, We're well, getting all these plays on music, people want to listen to music, so we'll just stifle all this other content that I was spending loads of time making it in, but it was just getting no views because no one, I wasn't pushing anyone to it or showing people, or the algorithm wasn't showing people because it wasn't getting suggested. Then I basically took all the music off and just been focused on my the channel being me now. And then we started separate channels for DT, for music, for techno, for nude, and for DT DMB. And they're, again, they're slowly growing. And I expect them to sort of mature at some point in the next year, year and a half, as we push more time into those as well. But holy moly, we did YouTube wrong for a long time. And I think we're, fi- I think we're finally now at a place where we've got five, six channels all focus on what they're doing, all focus on where they should be, all working the algorithm properly. But it's taken probably 12 years of learning to get to that point. So that was that was launching on YouTube. That's point four. And now my my channel's up to 36,000 and the, my DT one's growing, Shelly's growing, it's growing. It's just they take a bit longer because we're in a market where it's a lot more harder working, but you just got to keep pushing forward with the music. We're uploading loads of tracks. Uh, we're going to be, I'm going to push shorts loads on both channels. And we have our music talk channel, which is my interview channel, which is great. And that's growing nicely. So happy with those. And a lot of DT is it, it, like, it's been 15 years of my life. And it has been like, a lot of it has been me. Some like big chunks of it was me on me on my own. Now it's me and Shelly and Laws and Matt and Hobbs and my mom. And, but there was a point where it was just me sat in a horrible room. Uh, there was points where we had team and then we lost team. And then along the way, it's just, it's changed all the time. But a lot of it has been a lot of my life and a lot of learnings from my life for sure. Right, in 2000, back to 2008, we launched a podcast. Um, the main data transmission podcast has 819 episodes and has been, I think we launched it in May of 2008 from memory because I know we built the site and then I remember we built, basically, we, like I said before, we hard-coded all of the back end and we basically hard-coded a system that we could upload the podcasts and it would create the RSS feed so that it would go on Apple Podcasts. Which, like, thinking about it now, that's just what Anchor is now. Like, we literally built Anchor before Anchor was Anchor. 
And if we we like we'd have, we could have literally stripped that out as a whole separate company and had a podcast website company, which is ridiculous. Um, yeah, no one does now. It's all work. Like oh, it's, the site now is WordPress. I was we went through a stage. What was it before? It was this thing called like, somebody built it for us the second time around because we had it all at ASP. Dot, no, uh, dot, basically, got to a point where the, uh, the developer left and he went to do and do some very cool developer stuff, and I couldn't do anything more to it. And basically, we lost all that code and all that information, all that data, because I moved it onto, I had to rebuild it because I wanted to be able to change it. And it went into this horrible thing, and it was just so slow. And then I basically had to have it rebuilt the, the third time into WordPress. And I had to, basically, the guy who built it charged me a stack load, and I was paying it off for like two years at a, at a fee per month. And basically, he managed to pull all the data from that other site into WordPress and reformat it uh, and give me a kind of look that was like what nearly what it is now. It needs a refresh for sure, and I'll definitely try and do that this year. But yeah, we've gone through three lots of three lots of website versions. But yeah, but yes, yeah, so we've had podcasts for for since two thousand and eight. Actually, the only place now that you can find all those podcasts is on Mixcloud. And I was having a look through Mixcloud this morning, and what I'm going to do, I've started a ultimate DT playlist of all podcasts because I'm going to and I'm going to finish it this year. My goals this year. So the first ever podcast was Busy P who is the person that used to be manager of Delft Punk. He runs the record label Ed Banger. And that mix was just so good. Then we had Plump DJs. Carl Cox was 007. Number seventh mix ever, Carl Cox. Rodriguez Jr. was in there early. And I was doing a little search on things. Look, we had Kerry Chandler. We had Jack Skills. And Jack Skills actually texted me about an hour ago. Just say happy birthday, which is crazy. He's been on a few times. Ways and Odyssey. That was that was when they launched Ways and Odyssey. Like Surge, who was... Way, uh, who was uh, Odyssey, he would message me loads of music before a party we were doing in 2012 and said, I've signed a new alias. And we basically booked him and then he did that podcast for the mix. So that's 10 years ago. Green Velvet, Vitalik. Like we've had mad people on the podcast. Like you scroll down it. We had David Holmes did like the cinema orchestra like podcast, which is crazy. Uh, DJ Falcon. I had so many people. I'm definitely going to make this list. Um, like Sasha was DJ number nine. Uh, Marky, look, early Marky. Did, Moby did one for us, which was like two, number 15. And that was an amazing mix. Um, yeah, if you go if you go on there, look, David, let's see if we can find David Holmes. See if we can find what number it was. There you go, Moby, 18, look. Number 18, Moby. That's such a great podcast. Dusky did one in 2007, 2007. Zinc, 138. Yeah, correct. Wilkinson before, like when he was before like that. Yeah, really crazy. Really crazy people. Really early on crazy. I felt that well, I saw a Solomon one at number like 99 or something. Totally normal. That was for the Tony totally That was for the party. Yeah. And now we're up to 819. We had, I had screamed to 400 because I bumped into it Southwest 4 and said, will you do a podcast for us? Um, Ronnie Size did 500 and he did like five or six hours. Yeah, basically, we had Disclosure do one for us. Basically, I booked Disclosure, which I'll talk about in a bit when it comes to parties, and booked Disclosure. Um, and they did a, it was like the week before they blew up or the week of the they blew up online. Yeah. It was a vinyl only mix just, just, just because they were like, oh, I want to do, can we do a vinyl only mix? And so we were like, yeah, cool. And there's like a little slip of the vinyls you can, in the mix as well. It's got, actually, which I really like. I'm going to play a track, which I like really love, uh, from over the years. And this is by the two bears who basically is Joe Goddard, who is part of hot chip. It's also Raph, uh, Raph Rundell. It's off that debut EP. And this is called Be Strong, which I love the words to this. Two bears, be strong. Welcome in to those people that joined uh, whilst that was playing. Hey, I'm Graham Farmer. And today I'm celebrating Data Transmission's 15th birthday. I founded Data Transmission in 2008, February the 1st. Uh, yeah, crazy, crazy amount of time. 
I can't believe I've run a company for 15, 15 years and all the stuff that's happened. Right, back to 15 years and 15 points of happened to DT. The next one, the next one's really dark. Basically, in 2009 and 2010, we started and built a ticketing system. And oh my God. And I think we just wanted to do everything. And we and we tried and did before we run, before we could walk. We also had other influence from other companies saying, you should do ticketing, you should do this. And oh my God, ticketing is ridiculous. So those companies that do it now, it's holy moly. Yeah, holy moly. It's so hard. Um, so the ticketing has become, become a nightmare. Basically, running a ticket company was a nightmare. There was just loads of money obviously flying in. The accountant didn't have a clue what was going on. Because, and, I, and that's one thing I would definitely have had is better accounting. We would have, we lost just so much money we lost. Uh, and other the other thing was that we lost, it was other people's money. We just basically find it from other from our, our winnings. And it was just a nightmare. It was like how not to run a ticketing company in, in three or four years. And it really nearly brought the whole thing down, whole company down. Uh, thankfully, I had it as a separate company and it, it basically closed that one. And it was just the worst time of my life. I had people phoning me forever, uh, asking for money. Like I was basically in this flat on my own. I had my newborn child. Uh, I just brought up with my wife, and basically, like it was just me. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't. I, there was not enough money to feed myself. I had to, I had to bring my. I remember one July, I had to ring my mum, ask her for a whole load of money because um, there was there was just not not enough to pay the bills, not enough to feed the. Willow, I definitely was in it. Like at one point, I remember sitting in the corner in a dark space holding myself and just like, should I just give up with everything and all life and everything? And it was a really horrible dark time. But yeah, just push through. I always thought like, I'll just keep working and I'll keep finding work. I'll keep finding myself work and I'll keep finding, make, keep earning money, trying to earn money. It was just me back then. Every All the other stuff had left. Couldn't afford to pay anyone, couldn't afford to pay myself. Just pushed, pushed, oh, pushed through. It's so sad. I basically came out of it. Came out of it. Closed everything down. Liquid got liquidated. I'm still paying back 35 grand of just mistakes from a bad accounting, bad management, bad bad business management. Not doing what I was doing, know what I was doing. I'm probably going to pay that for a while, and just made real real mistakes, real bad ones, and it's cost a load, and it's cost a big chunk of my future until it sorts itself out and you just learn from that shit don't you at the time you're just doing too much partying and too you know you were too in deep in a party and too in deep in everything else and you had you know a fiver in your pocket and you decide whether you have to feed you feed your daughter and you're feeding your daughter and that's it and you're hungry all the time i wasn't healthy i wasn't doing anything and literally like pulling from peter to paul to just to, to try and well wow, even even staying alive honestly staying alive was at one point Thank you for your comments. I read them all now. It's amazing. Sorry, I didn't mean to cry. And you learn. Full on. You learn and you just work and get up and work and try and do pull yourself out of it and find more work and take things and just do what you need to do to get yourself through it. I paid my mum back. I paid paying back everything I've, that's ever cost me. And then fortunately, at that time, at that time, I started uploading music to SoundCloud. <laughs> And I started my SoundCloud channel. And at the start, I, I, I started with SoundCloud. I didn't want to be on SoundCloud. I didn't want to put music on there. I didn't want to put my podcast on there because we were trying to drive everyone to Apple Podcasts. And I was like reluctant to go on SoundCloud. And I went on SoundCloud and started putting cold podcasts on there and started being offered premieres. And I started premiering. And I'm sure I was one of the first to premiering house music. I know UK if we're doing it from a YouTube point of view, maybe a couple of others, but we were definitely one of the first to do it from a, from a, from a house music point of view. Um, and definitely on SoundCloud. And that was in 2000, 2014. I started to building that channel, and it and and then at one point I don't remember. Shelley might know. We went to we went to a party called in 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 Maystone. What was that party called, Shells? If you remember, and we found we were dancing and Jack Master were playing. I, and for those who know, I love Jack Master. He's one of my favorite DJs of all time, and. I absolutely adore him and he played a record and then basically about six months after I got offered and the basically the label had made a, a, an edit of the record because there was a, there was a remix it was a social festival that's right there was a remix of the the remix of the, the track was was a bicep track and bicep did this remix and I remember that speaking to the label and they're like well bicep won't want too much for it so we've basically done the remix ourselves 
and we're going to put it out. And do you want to premiere it? And obviously, I'd, I went, I went, lost my tur- lost everything at this party to this to track. And essentially, I was like, yes, hundred percent. I want to put. I'll, I want to upload this. I absolutely love it. And and today, that's the biggest track we've ever uploaded. It's done five million streams. And it basically kickstarted my whole channel, and everything that comes from my from everything I've learned from SoundCloud has come from that track. I built that that my main channel is now is just about to hit seventy five million streams. We've done a, I've got one hundred seventy thousand subscribers on it. Uh, I've learned if, what I what I say is I learned so much about SoundCloud over the years. We like like it's literally it literally saved my life that platform. Like because we, I monetized. I was one of the first people to monetize premiers, and it, again, we were frowned upon. And people, I'd say, I want to pay for premier. I've got an audience. I've got an audio audience. In a time now where there's influencers on other platforms, I'm still like an audio influencer. I see, I see yourself stay the SoundCloud channel as an audio influencer, and we were the first to say, look, we want pay. We're doing any paid premiers, and everyone's frowned about it. And now it's a, now everybody does it. Um, we were doing reposts and doing four thousand streams on a, on overnight. SoundCloud at the time, Jesus, there was a thing called repost. Like basically, you could repost a track uh, on another page and then the next day take it off and repost it again. And it'll basically just put it back to the top of the stream without having to make playlists or how to do tricks or hacks or anything else. And you just grew tracks like there was no tomorrow. It was ridiculous. Cara, I see your question. I'm going to answer it in a minute. I'm going to play this track and then just have a bit of a get these tears out of my eyes. And I'm going to play this track because it's really happy. It makes me so happy. And it's definitely a contrast to everything we just spoke about before. Before repost exchange, it was literally, you could go on another channel, just click repost and just, it will repost it, put it at the top of the page, go back the next day, take the repost off, press it again, and it will basically put it back to the top of the page. It was so simple. And then and then someone basically, so SoundCloud took it away and it's just been a nightmare. Anyway, and you have to do hacks to get around it now. But anyway, so this track, um, I still absolutely love it. I still, it's it's one of the biggest tracks on our channel. Uh, in fact, it is the biggest track on our channel. It's on 5.7 million streams. And this track, is, it's like it basically made my channel and it made it pulled everything out of the dark. It pulled everything out of the dark from that previous point. And I'm going to play it now. It's, called, it's by Dominica. It's called Gotta Let It Go. And it's an absolute weapon. We, so we premiered that track. Uh, people aren't going to track this. Our track? No, it's not our track. Basically, we premier tracks. So basically, we the labels promote uh, reach out to us because we've got an audience and we'll upload them. Basically, as a promo thing. So the label reached out and said, "Do you want to promote this on your channel?" And at that point, that was like seven years ago, and we started the channel maybe ten years ago. So it was sort of building. Like if I go and look in, if I look into stats and see if I can see like all time, right? So. That was like seven years ago was what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there, seven years ago, 2016. And I think I started that channel earlier than that. If I go back, can I go back even further? No, look, that's as far. You used to be able to go back further. You used to be able to go back to 2010. Because also those stats don't match. So we had actually done about a million odd streams before even that. Before even that. So we it was starting to build. And then that track came along and look, five point minutes of million streams. Uh, Mike Freak, you're right. Look. Mike, Fre- I premiered Mike Freak's track two years ago, which came from Sarah actually in the in the in the chat, no doubt, and that's done three hundred thousand. That's a mad like Michael Bibby remix of Inglasius has done one point one million. Hoogle and West End from last year sixty thousand. You want to listen to a really good track? Is that Crank Brother one? You're when you're watching, that's really cool. Josh Samuel's in there, which is wicked. Yeah, so SoundCloud for me is like it's been 
such a big thing for me, like learning SoundCloud. We built other channels off that main channel. That channel now is literally focused on house and deep tech and minimal uh, and house music, tech, house, deep tech. Now we have a drum and bass channel as well. Shelly runs drum and bass and jungle. I have a techno channel called Nude. I have a disco channel called Disco Infiltrators. I have a DT Weapons account. I have 63Bs account. Uh, I even have a Graham Farmer account somewhere. So yeah, so we launched, so with SoundCloud, like I've just, I've learned so much about SoundCloud. I've learned all the little hacks. I've learned literally how to grow channels of my own channels and really like how, like we get so many, like I was saying the other day, so many plays from just DJing. So I put certain tags in that I know DJs will search for when I'm putting on, when I'm doing uploads to SoundCloud. Yeah, mental what we've done with SoundCloud over the years. And it definitely like saved a lot of things. It certainly saved my sanity, it saved my pulled a lot of things out because we started making more revenue from SoundCloud, uh, from paid premieres and and just just from building those channels really helped, really, really, really helped DT. Um, and then, and really helped with my own knowledge, basically. Next point. So we've done some amazing, I want to talk about parties. We don't really do parties anymore because I don't, like I don't go to as many parties, but we've done some amazing parties over the years. Hideout Festival, like Hideout Festival, we did the first two years of opening at Hideout Festival. The first year we had a boat party, which was absolutely amazing. And I basically, they gave me a 200 pound fee for doing the boat party. And I was like, well, I'm going to spunk it all on, um, I'm going to spunk it all on fancy dress. And basically I took a suitcase for fancy dress of pirate stuff, took all pirate fancy dress and basically covered the boat in pirate fans, pirate giveaways. We did a boat party on the Thames and it was rubbish and it cost me thousands and I lost loads of money again. This was another, in the dark period, the dark times of data transmission in the, in the, of doing parties on the Thames. So we did this really cool boat party with Hideout and basically it was me and Dorley and Aeroplane. For those that know about Aeroplane, he's an amazing party person, amazing artist. And we basically, um, we got to, I basically got to Hideout and we were still sell, still selling um, tickets down the strip. We're literally walking down the strip and trying to get people to come in and sell the party. Um, and there was two boats going back out that day and there was basically our boat and the RA boat. And back then there was like this little rivalry, which like whether it was a sales rivalry or kind of like, it might have just been in our own heads, but it was like we had this rival with RA and they had, who did they have? They had someone that was playing three hours and we had disco in the sun and our party was packed and we pulled up next to ours and ours was like fully going off and people are waving cutlasses and pirates and fancy. It was just epic. And we just, it was like, it was a promo rival and theirs looked a bit boring and a bit dull, and went, but it was really great music, obviously, because it's because it's what, that, that, what they do uh, and they do it really well. And I don't know whether it was in my own head or we just we just loved it because it, because I was just pumping. Nowadays, I couldn't give a monkeys. But we did this really great boat, boat party at Hideout. And then the, we went back the second year um, and did a pool party and that was even, that was jammed. But yeah, the first year at Hideout, we got drops in Hideout and it was so like, uh, like, you just arrived and there was nothing. You were literally dropped in the middle of nowhere. The area, because that, like, that was like maybe 10, 12 years ago. And even the area of that part of Croatia was like, it hadn't been built up. It hadn't had festivals there very often. There was no way of getting, you had to walk from the where you were staying to the to the beach. There was no buses, no nothing. It was like really like, and I remember calling my mate and going, this is pretty, either it's really rubbish. And my mate was like, no, it's really acid house. Like you just, like you're in the middle of nowhere and you've got to find your way and you find the way at the party and you, and find everything you're going to get. It's just acid house. Like, get involved. And I was like, oh yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, like, and just making the good thing out of it. Like even, and, and now it's such a big thing, isn't it? Hideout and such like the promotion starts mad in advance. And, but then it was just so raw, raw like literally stripped back. And it was, it was fun. It was so much fun. And we did that mad boat party. And then the second year we arrived and we did the part, the pre-party, the day before the festival started. Uh, we did a, we did a DJ party, a DJ, uh, like a DJ competition in Manchester to um to pick uh, someone to come and play, and an art and a DJ called Jimmy Switch won it, uh, and that was his basically his, his second ever gig was playing um at Hideout, and for those that know Jimmy Switch, he then went on to be able to do a boat, and he was growing to be a really big artist, great decent artist of his own right, but it was like the pool was packed in. We had fifty people there within about ten minutes, but then within about half an hour there was about eight hundred people in there, um because it was the only party on. And it was everyone arrived early, went into that party, and it was rammed, and everyone was on the zombies. And then by an hour in, there was two thousand people, and Jimmy just basically couldn't play anymore because that was his second ever gig, and he was having to play to two thousand people. So I basically, I ended up playing DJing for three hours through through his hour, my two hours. The city was so hot, the CDJ stopped working because they were like the CDJ. They had USBs. There was two twenty. It was twenty. This was in twenty. This was in 2012 because my daughter had just been born because I had to fly back the next day. So it was in 2012. So there was, um, there was basically, there was there was USBs. Yeah, there was. 
everything was freezing. Everything wasn't done well. Um, we had to keep changing out the, the CDJs because they just kept breaking. Um, so that was fun. And then basically I played an hour of the last person's because she'd never played before as well. And by the, it was still packed. It was like you there was the pool. You couldn't see the pool because it was full of people. And it was just absolutely jammed. I was just, it was great fun. One of the best sets I've ever played. Really enjoyed it. And we did some great parties. We did a party of the XOYO. Um, I know I spoke about this before and we had Kink and Tale of Us and Manic and we spent three grand on the whole lineup. We used to do Big Chill House every January and this is where I had Disclosure play and we basically booked Disclosure. Um, I went to ADE in the 2011 because this was in 2012 as well. 2011 I went to ADE and met my friend Roman who I knew from Turn Mills and basically he was booking out Disclosure showed me a video and I was like, well, let's get them on. And basically Big Chill and King's Cross, we played that we did. They used to do every January and now we used to do this called Best Of. And we had Disclosure on one. For the eighth birthday, um, I had Rhythm Masters and Steve Max on next week with Todd Terry. So it's always good to have him. We also had Dismantle. We had, I'm trying to think of other people we had on there. We had um, XXXY we had on there. We had somebody called, I don't dig out those lineups. But yeah, they were cool. They're really cool parties, really great parties. Anyway, so that was that's pies. That's number whatever point we're on now. Number eight, you know, thing, 15 things we've done over 15 years. Holy moly. One thing that we definitely have done over the years is definitely tried to be other people. And I think like from from R like I, from RA to UKF to Boiler Room, and I think just like not been ourselves so much, you know? Uh, what was the first tune play the DT event? Oh, don't know. No idea. DT's net, like the whole party thing, we've done a few parties over the years and more like, more have been like, the first one was the teed one, which is for Silver Bullet. Then we did a few, where, a few Silver Bullet ones. And then we did the one at XOYO. We did one, and then collabs where we did ones, like we did one at Space, where I played at Space, which is really good. We did one, we've done some recently, but yeah, they're more, they're more like, and ex- an add-on like I like doing where we're where they where where it's a in a party already and we're just we host a room and we bring the t- we bring the party we bring our people and it becomes fun like we did one at Bristol Motion that was fun I definitely over the years have learned that I'm better at making content I'm better at finding content and looking at artists and looking at finding really good music than I am at putting on parties I'm definitely not a great person at parties we did some snow bombing which was really good fun in the mountains which was really good fun and we had like we hosted an igloo on the top of the snow bombing, which was really great. And we also ho- did some, did like some, some, some parties, parts of snow bombing. Has the logo always been the, the lo- This was the first logo. It was like this, literally trying to get on the website, which is mental. It went to kind of this, went to the side, to that side, and it kind of split data transmission into a, into more square, so it fits square. Because the problem with this logo was when you put it on the bottom of flyer, it was like the word was really tiny, and the and the and the ecstasy tablet was was. Um, was really big it just didn't work and then we moved to the the, the one that's that is now the, the that one that's that's been there since that one's been there for a, a while like i haven't changed that one for a while i think after the dark times i think i changed changed that to that one yeah we definitely got into all the party too often in the party like we we were terrible promoters we just get involved too much and and then just it was not being promoters and not being professional promoters, just being people that want to do a party because you're not, you're in it for the, being a party, not the, not the promotions. And like I said, the, the, one of the big things we've done is just not focus on ourselves, not focus on trying to be other people. Like I, I really love some of those brands and try to do things that other people were doing because they were doing it and not really folk going, going thinking, right, this is our plan and this is our business and this is what we're trying to do with our business and just bumbling along. And it definitely didn't work. It definitely made things terrible. And then now, and now I like I know where we are. I know what's us. I know what our music is. I know what our music policy is. I know what we're like we're always trying to push new artists and trying to find smaller artists. I'd rather write about small artists than than big artists. I see it like if our if our front page of data transmission is completely different to everybody else's, then this is our win. Because why would you go to a website where it's everyone's everyone's talking about the same stuff? Like you're not going to. You're going to go to Mixmag or you're going to go to Resident Advisor. So us being different and being completely different, it gives you an option. Gives you an option to read something different. So that's number eight, and that was quite a quick one. Thank God for that. <laughs> for another track. One of the parties we did do was snowbombing, and, and over the years we did some amazing parties. I booked some some of the similar people all the time because I really loved them. And one of the people I found over the years was an artist called Marty Mouse. I absolutely love Marty Mouse, and I love everything that he'd ever done. 
And I'm going to try and find this track now because I didn't scroll and do it earlier, which is really annoying at me. And if you're not aware of him, he Marty Mouse passed away last year, and which was terribly sad. He's done some amazing edits, but one of the tracks that I absolutely love, which I'm sure I've played on these streams before, and I know I play it to Shelley. And I'm going to play this now because I absolutely love it. It's definitely been part of Date Transmission's 15th birth, 15 years for sure. And this is probably one of the tracks I would say has been is is part of it. go so that's Mike Mouse uh, in front of all our friends I love that record rest in peace Mike Mouse miss you pal um, right so let's move on we're getting getting there quarter for an hour ago I'm going to try and get through these how do I meet Shell holy moly uh, I met Shell at a party on New Year's actually no I met Shell in Denny's hotel room uh, an after party in Denny's hotel room in Milton Keynes so I don't know Denny yeah, it would do in the pop charts, I reckon. It's a huge track. I mean, it's a shame it didn't do much. Yeah, it's huge. I think if you get that going on TikTok, you're mental. I was thinking you should be have play with a live band. It would be amazing with a live band. Right, yeah, so all of that happened. Holy moly, we're getting closer to the nearer the time. Uh, spoke about SoundCloud. We spoke about just not trying to be somebody else's. Yeah, man. We are so trying to be someone else for all a long time and then just found our own little feet and it was nice. And then 2014, 2015 now, we, I, I, I met two artists, one called Ben Sterling and one called Archie B. And it literally changed a lot of things. It launched in a whole new chapter. Um, this is when I started, basically just started, like Ben would come around my house because we both lived in Milton Keynes and we'd just jam and just... Yeah, he'd just make some music. We'd play some records. We'd chat about records. We'd talk about... I'd tell him about how to get tracks signed. I'd send tracks to labels for him. Sit, got help and get some records signed. Like, we'd go out networking. We went to a party with Numbers Party. Jack Master did a Numbers Party at E1. In fact, when I went to E1 to speak at the Tour Room last year, we'd stuck a sticker, a number sticker, up high. And it was still there where, where, where it stuck. And I walked into the into the kind of back room at E1. I was like, oh, that sticker's still there. Mad. And that was when we introduced him to Scream. And we were doing, we were just hanging out. It was really good fun. Uh, we went to IMS and ADE together and, and did loads of networking and just really found out what I learned all this time, a long time. Like I learned all this stuff over the, probably that was like 2014, 15. So maybe by then it was like six, seven years maybe. And we just learned so much about getting music signed. We were, I was helping with social media. I was building my social media back then. So I was helping him build his. We went to Defected Croatia together and, and this opportunity came up and I was like, where's can he play? And just like literally pushed him into a, playing a warm-up slot, which was half an hour long. We used to play at parties at my old flat, which is quite fun. And just really just got to a point where, where we sent those records to Jamie Jones, whereas Jamie signed five records in the summer. And he just exploded after that because it just all happened in that summer because his records were really good. We were playing, he was playing loads of our parties and he always held a party well. He always DJed really well. He always held the groove well and held the audience well and picked the records that were right. And he just had a real talent for doing that, uh, a real talent for making records and knowing what records were working. And he just exploded. It was so good. And I'm the same with Archie. Archie's been growing at a different rate and a different, he's, he's on his own journey. And again, he's done some great things. There's some great releases. And that time just learned what I didn't even know I knew. Came out by one of those relationships and just was like, oh, shit, I've lost a really good artist. But And then sat for about a month and just went, shit, I know loads of stuff. This is actually really good. Um, I think I'd already started putting content on social media by then because I started putting started my own channels 
It was really cool to see the development, like really cool. Like it was all happening at the time. And I was putting content on social media about what I was learning at the same time. And that was growing my Graham Farmer channel on Instagram. And also then it started on YouTube a little bit later. And that's when I did the re-reset of, re -re 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 -reset of YouTube, which I spoke about earlier. And then I basically put content out for a year with nothing, just literally drew, grew an audience on Instagram for a year. Any, nothing, no physical gain, no just trying to do anything, no financial gain, just literally put a content for a year and built, an, built a small audience. And then in, and then, and then that's when basically then that's when start one to one started. And the, before that, that was the start of everything that starts now. Basically, uh, I announced in November that I was going to do some one to one with some new people. Um, cause that had been about six months since Ben, when we had ended with Ben and we had 250 people sign up in, in about 10 minutes and it was mad. And we were just like, shit, this is cool. And started doing that in the December, January. From there, that basically turned into what is now the course. I basically did a course. Um, there's a YouTuber called Sunny Lenarduzzi, and she's really good at business and, and YouTube. And first I was watching her for YouTube and had to grow my YouTube channel and had to make my YouTube channel. But then she's now switched into building businesses and building her businesses, telling you how to build your business, basically, and building your course. Uh, and I did her course, and it was it's really, really focused what we do now. Everything we now do on YouTube and Twitch and is from that from that experience learned so much from doing that i've done other courses since on you instagram but that really really focused everything we do um uh, even focus more dt of what dt does as well it really helped do that as well um dt was pretty focused but then we changed some stuff with dt a couple of years ago and that now refocused that as well it really helped with that uh and now we have the course which is obviously you know about and i've spoken about loads um which is social media marketing and all the stuff i did with ben basically social media growth spotify growth demos sending demos getting music signed um which is which is great and that's about to hit 100 members which i'm really really pleased about and i know some of the members are in the call in the, in the chat which is great hi members social media wise when i started dt there was no social media no facebook there was forums there was don't stay in uh myspace was still about and i loved myspace i loved doing the skins for myspace and we i didn't adopt facebook straight away there was a massive failure there again i wanted to be being, bring people to my website i wanted people on my website and i was basically we had a database which was really big, and that was we didn't clean that as much as I should have done. Learned about database management, and we didn't. I didn't want to adopt Facebook, and we again we were slow to that off the mark, so bad. We bought we bought fan we bought fans and built numbers off bought fans, and that was terrible for the algorithm. It fucked all the pages, fucked our engagement, built our Instagram late. Then I actually started my TikTok early and then stopped, which is stupid. Should have just carried on with that, um, and now we're full on on YouTube and YouTube Shorts. Have you got any big regrets throughout the years? Defo, loads of them. Should have just really understood YouTube when we started into 2000, 2008 and really gone in hard. Definitely should have let go people that were negative when they were being negative for long periods. Because I had some staff when we, were in, when we were in the Holloway Road period and they were really, really negative all the time. And I should have just fired the fucker straight away and cleaned out negativity in the office or fixed it and been a better manager. Like... Two or one or two things should have just, like I was saying, just found our own path and our own rhythm, not tried to be anyone else, just be ourselves and just not just, just like all the stuff we bang on about now, like focus on us and just what we're about and our music. And once we started doing that, then everything just made it much easier. Got rid of other people that sh sh were just causing damage sooner. Stop giving people opportunities. Just I give people too many opportunities. I try and I try and I try and I try and I, and I know I now I should just. You've got like one, and if you fuck it up, that's it. You're out because I. You just go down too long a path, and it makes just it just ruins things for you, and just you just learn these things. You know, definitely fucked up not knowing about business and not knowing about the business parts of things. And when you're trying to do things, understand the business before you even try and do it. Because that definitely that's definitely mis made mistakes. Definitely with that whole financial nightmare, which we spoke about earlier. I'm not talking about that again because that makes me cry. So that's definitely uh, tons of mistakes. Tons, tons of like, I definitely, yeah, just more. It's like we didn't carry on doing things when we were, when they were, and just really focus on what we should have been doing. So that's socials. Like we, we finally kind of get there. It's like, we're, I know we're there now. I know what our plan is. I have a strategy. It's great. But over the years, holy moly, we've made every mistake with socials. I think that's what you've got. You've just got to learn and just try and try and try and try. I always think just get up, get up and start work. And the rest will work itself out. Just, I'm just going to work and I'll just keep going until I, until it makes it work. And, I, and I've definitely been a tit. I've definitely got 
too drunk and too hammered and ruined things for myself and then gone backwards. I've definitely rocked up to conferences, got on the got on the got on it too early and then been poorly and just not got the most out of it. But you learn all these things, you know. Okay, we're nearly there. Look, we're nearly there. I've got two more things. Where do you sit in 10 years? Do you know what? 10 years. I always, the, the big goals for me for DT is always want to try and break artists. I want to take a small artist and have channels big enough that I can I can shout about someone and then all of a sudden it get, they go big. Uh, whether that's being a record label or my own socials or my own channels or something, or just something where they just goes, it just happens. I want to educate as many people as possible in and try and push them forward in the most popular way on a correct community that's just just the work we've got now the community we've got now is absolutely banging i love it i love being on twitch and this is one of my final things we're going to talk about it's obviously twitch twitch happened two years ago and that's really changed a lot of things it really paid off some of those horrible debts uh it allowed us to a bit more staff and it does bring lots more thing in you know right and then finally let's talk about dt radio dt radio has been amazing uh we first launched dt radio on pioneer radio flipping years ago and I'm talking, this was way, really way back. I'm going to search on, I'm actually going to search on, I'm going to search, I'm going to play a track and then while I search and find out. And one of the tracks I'm going to play is a track I absolutely love and it's by an artist I absolutely love. Um, and we spoke about it a bit earlier. Um, basically, I went to ADE one year and we did a party with Jesse Rose's uh, Made to Play label. And basically, it was in this place called the Chicago Social Club, which is a really like, old theatre. I don't think, I think it's moved now. Um, and we did this party. It was Jesse Rose, Tommy Sunshine, uh, all the Jesse, all the Maids Play gang. But there was also an act that played right at the end who was absolutely amazing. Again, brand, brand new, just playing live, amazingly playing live, and and was just blown away. And then basically, because of that party, that was in the obviously in October of that whatever year that was, 20. Pretty sure that was 20, could have been 2011. Then we did a party at XOYO, and as I said, this is one of the artists that played. It's called Kink, and this is a track I absolutely love, and I'm going to play it. It's called Existence. Kink existence, which happened about twelve years ago. So yeah, I was speaking earlier. So just before I started that track, we Eagles and Butterflies did the first DT radio show, and we basically hosted it on Pioneer Radio. And we had like a, he did an Innovisions takeover. Look, I'm just having a look. There's number four, and it was eight years ago. So I'm guessing I can't see number one, but there's definitely it used to be every Friday, every Friday at one o'clock in the afternoon, and it was on Pioneer Radio. And then basically, yeah, Eagles and Butterflies is it every I think he did it for like two years, solid. And he curated it, he hosted it, and we basically put it was DC Radio, and that was DC Radio. At around a similar time, we were hosting brands podcasts, and they would do little series on our SoundCloud where it would be like a weekly series, and they would they would it would we would basically upload it onto our SoundCloud and they would essentially what we're doing now. It was an early version of DC Radio. And what it is now, basically. And then Bontan took Bontan took over DT Radio Show, and he ran it for another year and a bit. And then we then we switched over when he finished to four hosts, including Carly Wilford, my good friend who's been on this stream, um, and she's coming on the actual podcast in, in in February. So exciting to see her and her growth, and I love being with Carly. And then it turned into what DT Radio is now. And then this January, holy moly, we had our biggest month to date on DT Radio. We had forty odd signups. Our strongest year of 2020 to 2022 streams, like our biggest year of streams on DC Radio. Um, and I love what DC Radio is now. 
big up to the team that are doing it now and, and everything that's happened with DC Red over the years. I love it now and it's fully up in the team in our house. It's yeah. And it's been a mad January, mad start to the FTC radio. And that's about, I think that's, I think I've gone through most of them in the two, three hours, two and a bit hours. Holy moly. And that has been DC over 15 years. What a day. What a, what a, what a, what a thing. Now we've got the three record labels, 63B, DC, D, data transmission. And we are now taking DT weapons into a full label. Um, we're going to be signing loads of tech house tracks for DT weapons that are just going to be absolute floor killers. And pushing that as putting pushing that as much as possible, and we've got a record out today. Holy moly! Let's go full circle. Holy moly! Right, so from where we started at the start of the stream, we're going to play the record again. We've got a record out today. Basically, before Christmas on these Twitch streams, we dropped someone dropped a track into our into the Discord into the Twitch stream as we do on a Monday every Monday demo streams. This person was called Jax Carter. Oh my God! It just blew our little minds, didn't it? For those that were there. And those that are part of it. Oh my God. It did like, he basically bought a track called Data Transmission. He made a track called Data Transmission. So holy moly, we had to sign it straight away. And it's everything I love about that kind of sound. Let's play it now. And then we'll talk about that. I'll answer those questions in a minute. It's out on the 10th, but it's out today on Bandcamp. You can go and grab it today on Bandcamp. I upload it today on Bandcamp. So you can go grab it today. It's out on SoundCloud now. Uh, it's out on Bandcamp today. So you can buy it. Data Transmission. go that's as a day it's called data transmission i love it i absolutely love it i couldn't have asked for a better track to drop into our discord for our data transmission 15th birthday i'm so happy how exciting someone asked me a question in the chat then what do they say about it they said do i see myself going into how do you want to see the labels going do you want to go focus on youtube we're gonna i'm gonna push the hell out of youtube on all fronts uh we're now going to three youtube videos a week on the main channel we're going to me and Shirley are still doing two uploads a day for music, and we are doing a release. I think we're going to get to try and get to a release a week, but on different labels. Uh, so we'll do one sixty three B a month, one DT weapons, one maybe a DT, or maybe two sixty three Bs and two sixty three Bs a sixty a DT weapons, and then maybe a DT. But it depends. Uh, DT ones, I want to get really, really big tracks uh, and focus a bit more on on a bit larger. But build them up, build people up on DC weapons first, and then then they'll go onto main like main channel, or they'll maybe do 63B, or they'll just stay on 63B, depending on the sound. It's all about the sound and getting the right for the right label. I'm definitely not going to ice management. I'm the whole point of the course is just focuses on everything I know about from that sort of side. So anyone that's I, I'm working with one artist like that, but but the rest of everyone else is in my course. You know, we do everything for the course. The group call in my course is wicked. Wednesday nights on on our group call is absolutely amazing. Like every week we have a group call, um, seven till nine. Um, and we just, it's all questions answered. Um, and we just re, re it's like we do A&R in there. It's really good fun, the group call. For, it's like my favorite, one of my favorite times of the week. Yeah, shorts are definitely working out. Definitely, shorts are really cool. Like I'm really interested, like really, really like, really, really loving these YouTube shorts. Um, I'm definitely going to be pushing them more on the main channels as well. Um, it's just getting into a rhythm and a cadence of uploading and doing kind of setting some time to schedule everything. Yeah, I love Wednesdays, Loz. It's one of my favorite. Like I said, it's one of my favorite times of the week. Yeah, the talent in the group, in the group call with members is high, isn't it? It's, I, I, like We're going to definitely sign some more music off group members and course members. Um, and we're going to definitely do a VA of course member stuff shortly as well. Investment-wise, no, probably not. Like, we're just going to, I'm just going to, just going to keep growing, um, growing everything we do, basically, and just growing, cash, growing as we grow. There's definitely some great growth for the last few years, which has been good. And just keep, 
plugging at it and finding more music and doing what's working for us. Like we're really focused on, we're literally laser focused and laser focused on what we are doing now. I'm really, really specific on what we're doing, which is definitely working. Um, yeah, have I got any more music I was going to play? Did I, did I play that one, play that one, play that one, play that one, play that one. Play that one. I think I played everything I wanted to play. Oh, I'll play one more. I'll play one more. I've got one more. Um, what else are we doing this year? So we've got some cool shit going on this year. We're going to do... I'm doing something with BMC. I'm doing something with Berlin Music Conference in Berlin coming up, which is going to be fun. I want to do the whole... I want to do the whole barbecue thing, by the way, gang. Like, I really want to do the kind of shed head barbecue. I and mean, we need to find a date in the, in, the, in, the up, in the future and do that. I'd love to do that. We've got space in our garden, for sure. Our American friends will, will maybe we'll just have to get you on like a Zoom something on the screen. Maybe we can get get it set up so the tele use the big monitor and put it in there so we can put put you all on the screen so you can all join in. Right, let's play one more track and then I'm getting out of here because I need to go do some work. <laughs> Let me promo our record. Um, this is one track which I've uploaded on my SoundCloud, which is a bit different from what we normally upload, um, and I absolutely love it. It's by Crank Brother. It's called When When You're Watching Me. And I absolutely love it. So I'm gonna play it. And this will be the last thing I play. go that's crank brother when you're watching uh i hope you enjoyed that i love that record it's so different from what i normally like as well so it is but i absolutely love it seven years old that is as well man that's cool crank brother obviously do the mad parties in london yeah very calming it is kind of reminds me of the film the beach yeah death i reminds me of that yeah that was date transmission 15th birthday i'm gonna refine that a little bit i might turn that into book you know it's mad <laughs> Going back through all those years. There's so much to talk about. There's so much stuff I've missed as well. Because I started writing that this morning. I definitely can refine that some more. Uh, I'm also going to be doing some loads of DC15 content over the next week, next month, next year. This year, of the year. We're going to be doing DC all 15 all year, which is great. Very excited. As I said, on my, I've seen people have seen my face, but I'm actually excited about 15. I used to, those dark years, I used to think, shit, am I going to actually make it to the next? Like, are we going to make it to the next birthday? Are we going to make it to the end of the year? Are we going to make it to the next year? And now I'm in a point where we're like, great, let's push on. Let's get to 20. Let's see what we're going to do in the next five years. What can we achieve? What can we make? I hope that's been fun to you today. today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for your cake. Thank you for uh, the last, for the, I mean, no boo, no seca booze. We're going to go and have no seca booze in a minute. Thank you for Hobbs doing everything you do. And my mom and Shelly, everything that's part of Data Transmission and everyone that's been part of Data Transmission for the whole 15 years. Thank you so much.